All right. Are we recording? We're good to go. Oh gosh. Okay. So hello and welcome officially to Francis Tavern Museum's lecture, Preserving the Past in conjunction with October. Uh, again, my name is Mary Chaltis Ottomanelli, and I am joined with Lisa Goulet, who helped me put together this huge giant undertaking. So I am forever in horror in her just thank yous and graces and all that other fun stuff. Uh, for this lecture, we are going to explore 300 years of history from the landfill in the 1600s and its construction in 1719 to one of the earliest preservation projects in the 20th century. No big deal. So what we're going to do is going to start at the very beginning. Uh, on May 4th, 1688, the Common Council uh, noted a survey of the area where 54 Pearl now stands and ordered that the lots be 80 foot long into the dock and about four and 20 foot broad, leaving sufficient spaces for Yee Street as also to lay out Yee Street ranging from Yee here to Graf. It's a lot of Dutch, which just basically means that they're gonna make a bunch of squares made out of garbage. Landfill. Stephanus Van Cortland, the first native born mayor of New York City, obtained possession of two water lots the tavern stands on today on a grant dated November 19th, 1686 with an annual rent of one peppercorn paid annually on March 25th. Uh, you'll notice that there's a two year difference between these two dates. People were buying out water lots all along the shore and Van Cortland had to basically wait for the person in front of him to fill in that water lot for him to be able to walk out to build out his water lot. So it took a whole two years for even that process to even begin. Um, the project was undertaken by the city to build more docks and harbors to keep up with the growing trade. Before the landfill, the area was the eastern end of the Great Dock, which was built in 1676. So on this image, you can see where Francis Tavern is located today and just how much landfill makes up Lower Manhattan. It's a lot. I don't think you realize just how much, but when you realize how much we're in and how much there was, you'll see it. Now, once the land was filled in, Van Cortland transferred the land over as a wedding present to his daughter, Anne, and new son-in-law, Etienne Delancey. Um, a small strip, uh, excuse me, a small slip of ground be granted unto him upon the corner of the Broad Street and Dock Street for the making more regular, the said Broad Street and Dock Street, a large brick house, which he is now going to build upon his lot. Basically, you get to buy a house. There is absolutely no proof that the Delanceys ever lived in 54 Pearl Street. This is one of my favorite facts about the house is that you have one of the richest families in New York City at the time spending a tremendously large amount of money on the best possible supplies and things to build their house. And then by the time that the house was constructed, they realized that they didn't like the way that the neighborhood had changed, which basically means as the lots around them start to fill up, it was basically a maritime area and it was just too loud and noisy and they didn't feel like they wanted to live there anymore. So they moved more uptown to what we know as Delancey Street today in the Lower East Side. What a life. Um, so here is a closer look with Lisa. This is the deed to 54 Pearl. I begged her to take this out. So I hope everybody enjoys this.
they will not be watching the next of those videos. Oh, there we go. So although the structure is 300 years old, it's most associated with the activities that occurred around the time of the Revolutionary War. This includes, but is not limited to being the headquarters of the Sons of Liberty, a time when Francis acted as a spy during British occupation, General Washington celebrating evacuation day at the tavern on November 25th, 1783. And then about a week later, for his farewell address to his officers, which occurred in our long room on December 4th. This would be the last time that Washington would get to address his officers as the commander in chief of the army before he went down to Annapolis to give in his resignation as commander in chief and become just but a humble farmer, nice genteel farmer in Virginia, because nothing else was going to happen afterwards, but that did not happen. And after the war, when Washington gets sworn in as president, the building is rented out to some of the first government offices for John Jay, Henry Knox, and Alexander Hamilton in 1789. As we move into the beginning of the 19th century, the ranks of the revolutionary veterans begin to thin out, and although the tavern becomes less and less the scene of commemorative meetings, the builders never really lost its connection with Washington's farewell or Samuel Francis. Towards the middle of the century, the residential districts begin to move uptown, and the area around Pearl and Broad become a maritime district of largely five-story warehouses. Its structure, its function, and surrounding area no longer resemble the waterfront mansion that the Delanceys built about 100 years ago. You can see that there is a series of fires that plagued the building. The first one that I could find was in the 1830s. This was the first serious fire. Um, it's when I most believe that they started altering the building's facade. So as you can see in the image on the bottom right hand of your screen, this basically looks like an apartment building that you would find in New York City at any point in time. Um, the one in 1837, I couldn't find anything about. And then the one in 1852 was again, very extensive. I was able to find a New York Times article about it. The roof was destroyed. The interior was almost completely burned out and the walls on the Pearl Street side crumbled down so far as the top of the second story. The old floor beams of the lower two stories were not destroyed. One man was burned to death. Others jumped from the windows or were rescued by firemen. Uh, it's important to note that for the majority of the century, the Gardner family owned 54 Pearl Street. So all of the boarding houses that you see in there were just different renters in the area that would put their name on it. The most famous one that we know about is the Jacob Etzel one, which you can see on the top right hand corner. Um, when I say boarding house, I mean that the building had about 60 to 70 single occupancy rooms in the building. And I don't mean the whole building. So we're talking really tiny, tiny rooms. The first floor maintained itself as a retail space, much like it does today. The second floor maintained itself as the long room. Uh, people used it kind of like a common space in a dorm. It was very still known to be uh, a historic room, so they respected that. So you're talking 60 to 70 rooms all on the top three floors. So you think your New York City studio is very, very tiny. It's not that tiny comparatively. In the 1890s, the first floor of Francis Tavern completely changed on both the Pearl Street and Broad Street sides. The brickwork on the first floor was completely removed and replaced by cast iron and glass storefronts to give it a more modern look. The first floor on the Broad Street side was removed and the floor was constructed at the sidewalk level to accommodate foot traffic for the bar. This was one of my favorite additions to the tavern because they basically said like drunk people can't use stairs. So they want them to be able to walk in and walk out without getting harmed because they thought it would be bad for business. Take it for whether, oops, whoops, uh-oh, uh-oh. Hold on, technical difficulties. We are having technical difficulties. I was just talked, I was told. We are in the process of fixing it. I apologize, you guys. We're going to reshare the video. Okay. 
just keep loading. Nope. Sneak peek, guys. Don't look. Don't look. It's spoilers. Oh, we started all over. All right. Sorry about that. I am so used to just not talking to a screen. I am the old millennial who does not know how to use technology. Let's start this here. This indenture documents the transfer of the Delancey Mansion from Delancey Robinson and Company to Samuel Francis on January 15th, 1762. Francis paid a grand total of 2,000 pounds for what the deed states, all that contains dwelling, house, and lot of ground. An indenture is a real estate deed in which two parties agree to continuing obligations as outlined in the document. Generally speaking, an indenture functions the same way any other legal contract does today. In this case, the Delanceys granted and released and every part and parcel unto the said Samuel Francis and his heirs to forever defend. You'll notice that the document has been signed by many people, Oliver Delancey, Beverly Robinson, James Parker and their wives, the city clerk, the courier, but not Samuel Francis. Under ordinary circumstances, only the seller needs to sign a deed because only the seller has any obligations regarding transferring good title. The term indenture comes from medieval England when such deeds between two parties were torn or cut in half in a jagged or indented manner and could be proved authentic by matching the two pieces. This torn or cut edge was often stylized in wavy, jagged, or in this case, scalloped edges, as you can see at the top of the document. Words or letters were also often written across the cut to further prove a document's authenticity. Here, red wax seals served the same purpose. After signing, the paper was folded over on itself, a ribbon threaded through the bottom slits, and then fastened underneath the hot wax. All right. We learned something new. And then we're gonna skip this one because we did it. And we're gonna skip this one because we did it. And that one as well. All right, we are gonna move into the colonial revival movement. So the early 20th century gives way to this movement, which was a preservation movement that put a very heavy emphasis on a very romanticized version of American architecture. So this movement happened during a time of rapid urbanization, industrialization, and immigration, which encouraged many Americans to seek refuge in the perceived simplicity of the past. Uh, think of how people always want to go back to the 1950s because of poodle skirts and like milkshakes. Kind of like that. Was it a better time? Not quite. Was the architecture the best then? Probably not as like bad as brutalism, but still we'll go with it. The problem with this movement is that followers were more concerned with the with preserving the spirit of the American Revolution than with the adherence to historical accuracy. So when I say that, what I mean is that there are summer homes in Connecticut that resemble Mount Vernon in like giant pillars and they have this plantation-esque situation and that is not historically accurate in any capacity, but it looks pretty, so they went with it. Uh, this is a great image courtesy of Christine Huckins Frank, who is an architect, who is a native New Yorker that I found. Uh, she was wonderful and she let me use this because it just shows you just some cute little unique issues that the colonial, colonial revival movement had. Uh, I am not an architecture buff by any means, but I learned a lot doing this. So the restoration of the tavern is, is just so inherently entwined with the colonial revival because the building wholly represents the growth of the patriotic groups and organizations and their efforts to save and commemorate important sites in our nation's history. Uh, especially those with ties to George Washington, which 54 Pearl has. Interest in these historical sites had been limited to battlefields and much more important locations like presidential homes. So the interest makes history a lot more accessible, which is not a lot, which is not something that I think people think about often. You are able to go to these places that you would have never been able to go to. So think of the, the normal New Yorker from a lower class neighborhood would never have been able to travel down to Virginia or to Philadelphia or Boston, but they're able to go to a place where George Washington stood at a very important time. And it makes them feel like this is their history as well. Kind of like my thing. So by the early 20th century, historic preservation groups start to hone in on 54 Pearl because they're starting to see its importance. Uh, one of the first groups 
to bring their attention to Francis Tavern was the Daughters of the Revolution. In 1900, Dar turned to the American Scenic and Historic Preservation Society to purchase 54 Pearl. They led this campaign, which is absolutely wild, but it's one of my favorites, to acquire what is now the entire historic block district. So you're talking Water Street, Broad Street, Pearl, and Fuentes. They were gonna knock all of those buildings down, pick up Francis Tavern, put it in the middle of the block and make Patriots Park. Now, as part of a staff who wishes they had outdoor space, this sounds great today and we wish it had happened, but it would have changed a lot of the history of Francis Tavern. Uh, they petitioned to work with the New York City Parks Department, but their plan was denied because of costs. Um, this is a time when women are not allowed to vote. They do not have access to their own funds. They don't have their own bank account. So a lot of it was going to be bankrolled by the Parks Department. And with their budget of only a million dollars, they flirted with the idea, but they ultimately passed because of it. Uh, in 1904, the SRNY purchases the building from the Gardner family. And the Gardner family didn't care much about the historical importance of the building. They were honestly, truly just looking for a really good deal. Uh, thankfully, the sons came with the right one and everything was accepted. The purchase and preservation efforts were spearheaded by Frederick S. Talmadge, whose portrait you can see here. He was very much involved in the fundraising, the acquisition, the haggling with the Gardner family, the preservation. He worked very closely with Mercer out to make sure that the building looked as colonial as possible. I guess colonial is probably the best word. It's got a bunch of different architectural issues with it, but we'll go into that a little bit later. Um, unfortunately, Talmadge passes away just months before the building's opening, which is unfortunate because you, you realize when you study this and you start looking at all of these notes, how much he really just loved this building. Here is a closer look of the indenture obtained by the SRNY for the ownership of 54 Pearl Street. It is by no means as grand as the one that Samuel Francis has, but it still has that kind of charm the handwriting is beautiful, and I love that shiny, shiny seal. It was very cute. So in 1805, in 1905, excuse me, William H. Mercero in, is a Staten Island native and preservation architect, is contracted by the SRNY to begin the restoration of 54 Pearl. I saw Sarah give a thumbs up because she's a Staten Island native. Uh, the restoration is one of the first and largest of its kind in the United States at the time. Not many people had undertaken such a large building that was this old. Normally it had been like, you know, a couple of lumber here, new window here, and it was a very small situation, but this was in a very large metropolitan city. Uh, this is the original statement of costs Mercero submitted to the SRNY after his initial survey of the building. I love these prices. Some of them make absolutely no sense, so I thought I would share it with you. Uh, the brickwork was $5,000. There was a refrigerator worth $200 and a tearing down of an old building for $500. It's been a year and a half and I still have no idea what building they are referring to. Couldn't tell you. I also really just like the handwriting on it. All right, this is a clip. Lisa is gonna give you a closer look at the Mercero architectural plans during the restoration. Fun fact on these, we found them hanging out in the back of our archives in an unmarked box. And it was like finding Christmas in the middle of November. It's amazing. In 1904, the SRNY contracted architect William H. Mercero to lead the building's restoration project. Work was completed in a three-phase plan. First, all material deemed to have been added in the 19th century was removed. Second, all historically and architecturally significant sections of the remaining building were stabilized. And third, new designs were added to complete the structure as it stands today. Mercero presented these drawings to the project committee in 1905 based on the evidence he discovered after over a century's worth of alterations had been peeled away. The drawings incorporate the areas of the building he found to be original into a cohesive design for the 20th century space. In his designs, elements such as the red and yellow bricks were married together between the Broad Street and Pearl Street facades through the 18th century windows. Floor to ceiling wood paneling was applied throughout as he believed the Delanceys would not have spared any expense building their mansion and a distinctive hipped roof lowered the building back down to three and a half stories from five. In March 1907, the New York Times covered the tavern's restoration as the project was nearing completion. 
In the leading article, Mercero says, every brick and piece of lumber, so far as possible, of the original building has been left in place. He suggests his design choices are so faithful to the colonial era, saying, if one of our former citizens of the year 1783 could return and pass the old tavern, he would notice no change in its appearance from that which it had in his own time. Critics of the transformation suggested that the building was not historically accurate and Mercero was taking too many artistic liberties in his design. They disputed his choice to include a hipped roof, which he refuted in an accompanying explanatory article. But Mercero's task was an impossible one, to recreate the building in its original image when he had found nothing of the sort existed. In 19... There we go. I'm not doing too good with the technology and I apologize. Uh, just to recap, Mercero broke the restoration down into three major phases. So the first one was that all material and architectural elements deemed to have been added after the 19th century were, were removed. Phase two was that all historically and architecturally significant sections of the building that remained were stabilized. And that on the third phase was that the new work was added uh, to complete the structure. So as Lisa mentioned, Mercero took on an almost impossible task to recreate the original building with literally no illustrations or descriptions existing. So he had to look to buildings that were still standing from the same time period. Two colonial structures that heavily influenced Mercero's restoration are the Van Cortland and Phillips Manor that you see here on your screen. Uh, they were both built in the same 50 year period and redone in the same English style. Mercero visited these locations several times and a very big emphasis on several, like he just kept going back to them. Um, he would take meticulous notes and measurements from everything from the designs on the banisters to the size of the windows. You can definitely see their influences on the tavern. During his initial research of 54 Pearl, it was discovered that the illustration in the Valentine's Manual, which you can see here on your left, was not Francis Tavern. This was considered one of the oldest illustrations of Francis, but it turns out that it was not. It was probably Francis's other bar Vox Hall, which was located in, on Greenwich and Warren Street. Uh, for those not familiar, the Valentine's Manual is akin to the Zagat Guide that tells you all the cool places to go in New York City. So we've been on it since the 18th century. Uh -huh. Here is a closer look with Lisa about original building elements. We have some hidden 1719 things. Original exterior walls, masonry around the window openings, and some window frames on the second and third floors were among the many elements revealed during the first phase of Mercero's restoration. Here you can see some of the oldest parts of the building's interior construction, which date back to 1719. As Mercero writes in a letter to the project committee, the self-same beams on which Washington stood are there beneath the floor of the long room today, and the tier above is the same and old walls are the same. The old hewn beams, however, exist still in the hallway, in the floor, and the ceiling of the second and third stories on Pearl Street. Here and there on the underside of these old beams are vestiges of hand split lathes and handmade nails, proving that the old ceilings were plastered and that the beams were not exposed. These photos show the oak ceiling beams and interior wall plaster located in the southwest corner of the long room on the building's second floor. The ceiling beams are about two feet thick and were reinforced with steel during the restoration, not only to improve the structural integrity, but also prevent the spread of fire. In the next photo, if you look closely, you can see a tuft of animal hair embedded in the plaster. Traditional lime-based plaster contained horse or cow hair for reinforcement. It was applied over a layer of lathe, a series of thin horizontal wooden slats to form the building's interior walls and in our case, ceilings too. The lathe and plaster technique in its various forms became widespread in the mid 18th century and remained so until the 1950s with the development of drywall. Wrought nails, such as these ones, were used to secure the wooden slats into wall and ceiling studs and were used until machine cut nails were invented in 1790. Cool. Original. Oh, okay. So for phase one, all material and architectural elements deemed to have been added after the 19th century were removed. These photos are from phase one when Mercero first started the restoration process. He literally stripped the building all the way down as much as he could. Uh, it's when he discovered the original 1719 roof. 
In his letters, he writes about finding different sized bricks on the third story, which is where the additional stories were added after the fire in the 1830s. Phase one also included having the same company that modernized the first floor at the end of the 19th century to come and undo what they did. So he literally hired out the same company to put the stairs back, uh, deeming that drunk people can in fact do stairs. Phase two includes stabilizing the original bricks. So the bricks are some of my favorite elements from 54 Pearl because most of them are from the original 1719 structure. If you've ever visited the tavern, you would notice that the exterior has those two separate bricks, uh, the red and the yellow that you can see in the middle image here. Mirthro wrote in his findings that the old bricks were also easily identified from the fact that they were laid in a mortar made from local sandstone and containing a good proportion of oyster shells because we are on Pearl Street, uh -huh. full circle. The newer brick was laid in an ordinary lime and sand. So the early 18th century brick is generally located around the window openings, while the 20th century brick is located between the stories probably when they were doing reinforcing. The yellow bricks were initially going to be handmade to match the existing bricks, but by some great luck, I don't know what that means, there was still a yard in Rotterdam that the 17th century bricks were all still being made by hand. So they ordered 14,000 handmade yellow bricks to be used for the outside of the building, which is absolutely wild when you think about it. I, I'm still looking for the customs paper because it's, it's going to haunt me till the last day that I work here, possibly. Um, <laughs> it said... The red bricks, by the way, the only thing that I can find about them when they were needed to be replaced, they were acquired from old homes that were being torn down in Baltimore. I found this in like a very weird letter that nobody really wanted to talk about, but why mention it? I don't know. I'm not in charge of this project. So phase three included some 20th century fireproofing. Mercero opted not to go with a wooden roof. He opted to go with a nice copper one uh, and some other new shiny updates, including that refrigerator. He also added the top floor as an additional meeting space. <laughs> Sorry. The SRNY opted to restore the building to its appearance in the 1780s rather than its original appearance in 1719, mostly because Mercero had a lot more inspiration to draw from from the 1780s than he would in the early 1700s. It can be considered a Neo-Georgian style because the house is a symmetrical rectangular block with matching chimney stacks, a center door framed by a classical order, and dormer windows, among other elements. I love showing this photo. It is the first day that the museum is opened on December 4th, 1907, paying homage to Washington's farewell. I also love showing this because it shows you what the neighborhood looked like. Uh, it's always good to remind myself that Francis Tavern had direct sunlight at one point in time and we weren't always just in like a very cloudy day. <sighs> See, that outside space doesn't sound that bad when you think about, you know, Patriots Park. Lisa is going to talk a little bit more about the long room and some of the hidden 1719 features inside. The long room is one of two period rooms in Francis Tavern Museum. It documents 18th century tavern life in New York City and what Francis's ordinary service would have looked like at that time. Nearly everything in the room is authentic to the time period, but not to the tavern. The Long Room is a particularly important site in early American history. Located on the second floor of the tavern, this room was available to use as a private space for larger gatherings and meetings from Francis's tenure through the 19th century. It was the location of Washington's Farewell, where the New York Chamber of Commerce was founded, and the last place Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton partied together before their infamous duel. The long room in the early 20th century, after the museum had opened to the public, functioned much the same as it had in the past, as both a gallery and meeting space for dinners and other events. The addition of new floorboards was undertaken in the 1970s as part of the country's bicentennial celebrations. These floorboards were salvaged from a barn in Pennsylvania. They measure between 8 and 12 inches in width and are secured with steel-cut nails with a special head. Since these boards were butted together, it took many hours of scraping to level the entire floor. The room largely became what you can see today in 1983 with the exhibition for the entertainment of friends and strangers, which re-envisioned the space as a period room for the first time. 
Regardless of what role 54 Pearl Street took on over the centuries to meet the needs of the neighborhood, it has continued to be famous for Washington's emotional December 4th farewell to his officers following the end of the American Revolution in the long room. The long so I like to show these photos right afterwards. Uh, the photo on your right is in uh, from 1910, which is when the tavern first opened again after the after the big project. And the one on the left is when the SRNY sold war bonds outside during World War One to raise money. Very patriotic. It's one of my favorite shots, mostly because nothing looks like it's changed since then either. And then we have. Francis Tavern in the 1940s and the 1930s. Again, still look how nothing is built up around the buildings. You can still see daylight. And then I like to show these because it's important to understand just how unique this area is, especially to Lower Manhattan. In 1965, 54 Pearl was designated as a New York City landmark. And in 1977, the entire block was designated as a historic district on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, in the late 1960s, famed architect for the New York Times, Ada Louise Huxtable, wrote about the historic block district. She said, what the Francis Tavern block represents now in professional urban terms is the most valuable kind of architectural townscape, a real surviving cohesive group of structures of a specifically related period and style that forms as an incomparable dramatic foil for the present, the kind of historical and aesthetic setting for which there is no substitute and without which a city is immeasurably poorer it is a rare island of historical authenticity. Um, if you are in the area, go grab one of their very fancy Oktoberfest beers. Take a seat and look at 54 Pearl. Look at 54 Pearl, look at 58 Pearl, and all of the other buildings on Pearl Street. When you're done, pay your bill, leave a good tip, digest, walk around the block, take a look at every single building on that historic block and recognize how different they are from each other because they were all built in the 1830s and the 1840s. So they're not that far apart, but they all have, when I was learning about architectural terms, very different styles. And for completely no reason other than the fact that developers wanted to put them in any style that they which way chose. So it's very interesting because it's just truly a hodgepodge but just again, that we don't have these hodgepodges in New York City because it's very much a city that's like, rip it down, put up a plaque, put up your skyscraper and we'll talk about it later. So the fact that we have these buildings is truly just so special. And again, even in the 1970s and the 1960s, it's still not built up. Look at all of the skyscrapers that are only starting to be built in this area. I like to show what I like to call modern images, even though they're from the 70s and 80s, because it shows you colorized versions of the building. They do exist. The one on the left is my personal favorite of the building, just because there's just something so nice and unobstructed again about the building. So last year, 54 Pearl celebrated its 300th birthday. In that short amount of time, we have survived a cannonball fire, a revolutionary war, a terrorist attack, urban development, hurricanes, and now a pandemic. Uh, none of these would be possible if it wasn't for the community that has supported the museum all these years before and what I hope for the difficult road ahead of us in the upcoming years. So I just want to say lastly, a very special thank you to Lisa and Allie and Amanda for helping me put this thing together because as you can tell, I'm not technical, technologically good at these things, but they are. All right, so we will open it up to questions. All right, thank you, Mary. That was really interesting. Um, Oof. <laughs> that part's done. <laughs> we have a couple questions. Remember, you can still submit them. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Um, so my first question, it's funny because we were just kind of talking about this before we started. Uh, it's coming from Mike who asks, was uh, William Mercero related to Joshua and John Mercero of the revolution's Mercero's firing? <gasps> yes, we think he was. Um, I was, interestingly enough, just writing the Nathan Hale blog that's on the website. And the Merceros were in a weird footnote in a citation in one of the books. And I was like, oh, no way. <laughs> um, but there, in the Mercero papers in our archives, we have his full entire family history. And I was able to trace it back. Like I came running into the office one day and I was like, I need to find this one piece of paper because I think I'm onto something. And everybody thinks I'm crazy when I'm doing this. But yes, it is part of the Merceros firing. Interesting. So he yeah. had a sort of to like New York revolutionary. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, 
Oh, I have a question from Colin. Uh, what was the mysterious sail lock used for? To make sails. It was one of the first sail loft area, excuse me, buildings in the area. So that big area was used to basically make shipping sails. So that's why it's such a large area and they have that loft because you would have to be able to sew things in if you didn't have a ladder. Not just for ghosts, amazingly. That's just what it's for now. <laughs> so talking a little bit about the tavern outside of its 1719 existence, but before we start um, re re revitalizing it, um, what was going on there in the 1860s? Ryan notes that he's curious about it during the Civil War. There were so many riots in the city at that time. Was there any notable stories about it? 1860s. Um, it was still a boarding house. So you had a lot of just single uh, like longshoremen and merchants in there that would rent out the space. The retail in the 1860s, I think was like a grocery store if I'm not mistaken. So I don't know the political climate specifically that was going on in the building, but I think it was just like people trying to go to work and not getting involved maybe. I don't know. That's a great question. I'll have to look into that. All right, let's see. Another one from Ryan, is Francis Tavern the oldest, oldest existing structure in Manhattan or is there another site? <sighs> Ryan's it's a the weird, point. tricky question. I mean, just because we are 1719, we kind of are considered, but I mean, because there's been so many additions to the building, I personally don't think it's one of the oldest buildings. I think just because it's just been like mutilated so many times and like added to and changed. Um, no, I think that's our tagline though. So don't fire me. I guess it depends on what you interpret as old. Existing, old and existing structure. Old and existing, yeah. There's definitely older ones in like the five boroughs situation that have not been like touched. Mm -hmm. it's, good it's, a answer. it's a good answer. Some questions don't have easy cut and dry answers. Um, let's see. Ah, Judith says, um, I noticed that the first floor interior has a warren of different rooms which have varied levels and ramps leading from one to the other. And this is true also for the upstairs part. <laughs> <laughs> the ramps going in everywhere. We're several <laughs> everywhere. added to the tower <laughs> over the years. So what's going on there, Mary? Why is it so hard to get around? Uh, because uh, if you've ever been to the museum, it's literally not even the restaurant, but the museum, every time you encounter like two or three different stairs, you are literally entering a new building. So the whole museum, Francis, like Francis Tavern Museum and Restaurant is five buildings in that historic block district. So when you leave the McEntee Gallery and you move into Messick, there's those two little stairs. You are literally walking into a building on Water Street. And then when you leave that gallery space and you go into the Flag Gallery, you are entering 58 Pearl. And then if you walk even further, which most of you are not allowed, you enter into another Water Street building, which is our staff administration offices and like a bunch of archives and stuff. I, I don't, I mean, historically, like, I don't think you were allowed to mess with the buildings that much when you were squishing them together. So it was just kind of like, well, here's the beam. We can't move around. So let's just do the two stair situation and they're just going to have to deal with it. But I know that it was necessary because at one point in time, the staff bathrooms were in a different building and you would have to leave that building to go to another building. So I'm okay with the two stairs. Yeah, I'm okay with, as a person whose office is technically in 101 Broad Street, I'm, I approve. Yeah, we're fine. We're the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is an interesting question from Don. I don't know if you'll have the answer to this one, but I'm oh. very curious. Does Francis Tavern have or had air rights that were sold to build neighboring skyscrapers? Ooh, I would have, oh, I see Ambrose saying no. <laughs> no, I trust Ambrose. Ambrose <laughs> is our... S-R-N-Y extraordinaire. And he says no, and he's laughing at me. So I think I said the right answer. <laughs> All right. I didn't, pick the, I didn't pick the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, ooh, so many questions are coming in. Um, oh, gosh. Was there, 
<laughs> was there anything found beyond the glassed over remains of the 17th century tavern across the street? So do you know anything about that, uh, the old Lovelace? Ed? The Lovelace, that's a great question. We have an incredible blog post that was written by Allie on our website that goes into like complete detail about the Lovelace. Um, if you are going to go grab a beer, go across the street and you can actually see the foundations of the first city hall from like Dutch New Amsterdam too also. So one thing they did not tear down or put a plaque on, amazingly, across the street from us. All right, um, here's an easy question. Does Francis Tavern have a basement, Jason wants to know? Oh, does it? It's the creepiest place in the entire world. Um, Francis Tavern was not originally, I think, meant to have such a basement uh, because we need things like heaters and boilers. It's kind of just adapted to the situation. So the, the ceiling literally goes up to like three and a half to four feet in the basement. But amazingly, the restaurant makes do with it, man. Their storage downstairs is impeccable. It is. I would say if you think that the restaurant or the museum is a warren of rooms, if, if you ever are allowed to go down in that basement, it is even more twisty turny. Amazing. It's a little horrifying. It's a little <laughs> horrifying, though. Um, let's see. Uh, so Charlie asks, the long room strikes me as a bit upscale for a tavern of the era. Is that the case? Or was there more? Was there a more common bar type area for everyday folks? There was. So the restaurant downstairs kind of mimics what the, the Francis's tavern would have looked like in the 1770s. Um, just a myriad of little rooms here and there. And then he would have had the upstairs second floor as like private dining spaces. So we have the Clinton dining room, which is another period room. Um, more That's an even fancier room, if I may. It's got carpeting and forks. Um, mm -hmm. The kids love it. They think it's amazing. Um, they would have rented out rooms like that. So the room that Washington uses, the long room, technically would have been like a private dining space that you would have rented out, which was very expensive because he would have charged you down to every single candlestick that you used. Not bad. This is a personal yeah. question. I don't know Fancy. if you'll know it. Did Washington pay for the long room when he was there for the farewell? Or 100% no. 100% no. 100% no. That was like, a, that was a courtesy. You don't charge George. That was a comp. <laughs> yeah, he comped it. I think okay. we have the receipt from that, the liquor receipt somewhere in our archives. I think Lisa can confirm this, right? We have some sort of liquor receipt. And she just made a face. <laughs> yes, but I can't confirm any specific one off the top of my head. <laughs> there was a raging party at Francis Tavern and Samuel Francis billed somebody for the liquor. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a lot of liquor. All right. Uh, I'm, this is a, a couple people submitted this one. So thank you to everyone who submitted this. I'll just say ghosts. 100%. We, oh God. <laughs> uh, um, we've had paranormal. Yeah, you've struck a nerve with all of me. Thank you all 115 of you. Um, we have had paranormal investigations done in the building. We are looking to redo one um, in the last couple of months as the staff has started to return to the building. We've noticed um, a lot more footsteps and a lot more creaking. Um, I reached out to a paranormal investigator and she basically said that like, they're wondering where everybody went and they're like, oh, people are back. That's so exciting because she said that the spirits sometimes get lonely. Um, I held my own personal ghost conference, which was basically me screaming in the building going, please don't bug me while I'm here. I'm very scared and I want to be here on Mondays. Oops. Fire truck. Sounds like a ghost from my end. <laughs> no, just the other day we had two instances in the same area in the flag gallery by two separate staff members who had no idea it happened to each other. Um, both of them looked horrified. So I no longer go in that gallery space. Definitely ghosts, 100%. <laughs> Good to know. Hopefully we'll have more information on that for you all soon. So stay tuned. Keep an eye on our website and social media. You might be seeing <sighs> Jason wants the to know things... what happened in the gallery space. So what happened? I also don't know what happened. Okay. So um, my Allie's sitting here already horrified because she's trying to help me with the IT stuff. Um, one of the instances was last Sunday, our visitor services associate, Teresa, 
was locking up the building at the end of the day and she heard a bunch of very heavy footsteps. So she goes, well, if you look at the cameras, you can see me running. Oh, Teresa said yes. Uh, <laughs> I saw that comment pop up. And then the other day, Allie went to go get something from our little media cabinet in the corner over there. And I heard like a very, like a scuttle because she was running back to the office just screaming, no, 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 no. And I said, what happened? And she said that there was a very light set of footsteps walking along with her. But what's very important to note about these ghosts, and this is getting very off topic for an architecture tour, is that they are not mean or malicious. They are very inquisitive spirits. They, I, we've never had a negative experience of anybody like trying to get at us or like scare us. It's more of just like, oh, hey, you guys shared this space too. That's cool. But we were here first. And I acknowledge that and I give them all the space they need. You know, that gallery space is right below the sail loft. Maybe they are just trying to work and we are disturbing them. Uh, oh, horrifying. <laughs> All right, um, let's see, did this one, I, oh, so what were the years that the Delancey family owned that property at 54 Pearl? 1719 until technically 1762. So Samuel Francis purchased it, purchased the building from Delancey Robinson and Co, which it was Etienne's son's mercantile company that he had with about three or four other people. You saw their signatures on the bottom of that deed. Um, so they owned it, but they never actually lived in it and they kept passing it along to their children. Interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, where do the items in the long room come from? We know they're, you said you're, they're original to the time but not to the space, just generally. Where, how do we get our hands on those? They come from everywhere. They are, some of them are all known from other museums. Some of them have been acquired and part of our permanent collection. Um, We've had really great donors in the past. I know our, one of my favorite pieces is obviously that long table because it's such a rarity to get your hands on something like that that's still standing and it's in pretty beautiful condition as well. So if you have any old furniture, send it. Really old. Really old. Like can't sit in it, can't even touch it before it falls apart. All right, I'm seeing we have a few people submitted this one. The um, bombing in the 1970s, what was the extent that that actually um, impacted the building itself? It didn't quite, um, there wasn't too much of an extensive amount of damage to the building for that bombing. Unfortunately, there were a few lives lost. Um, it's a very tragic event that happened um, because it was just so isolated in one part of the building. It, it did remain structurally sound. If you go into the, the cell room in the Francis Tavern, like restaurant part of the building, in the back, there is a giant crack that was left from the bombing. Um, there's a sweet plaque in New York City honor of what happened, but structurally nothing, thankfully. Okay, all right. So I think we are just about at the end of our time. One last question for you, Mary. If you could have dinner or a drink with anyone uh, from this <laughs> who would it be? Mary asked this to all of our lecturers, and it's a great question. So now she gets to answer. Oh, the turntables have turned. I actually, I would probably just dine with Samuel Francis. Like, I have so many questions for him specifically that we just don't know that would be great fillers. You know, like Phoebe. She's not real. Tell me about the hickey plot. What happened? Real? Not real? We know those chickens didn't die. Tell me more. You should ask Lisa this question as well because she hasn't had any answerings yet and she helped me with most of this. Lisa, come off mute. Answer our question. Have you had a ghost experience and who would you eat with at Francis Tavern? Experience. Um, I mean, a couple of weeks ago I was trying to lock up the building and it kept telling me that there was motion in front of a motion detector that was like very clearly empty. So mm -mm. That's, that's my, me as well. That's mm -mm. my singular ghost experience. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not yet convinced that we have ghosts. I've heard many of footsteps. <laughs> I haven't heard it. I, I've only heard people working in the building. Um, no, this was like nighttime. There was no one in that building. 
Never happened to me. They don't like me. <sighs> they're, they're afraid of me. Well, who are you dining with? I actually, I'm amending my previous answer. I also want to dine with Samuel Francis, pretty much because we hardly know anything about him. He's such a mysterious figure for someone who like has their namesake on this building. Um, but I would rather, rather than dine with Samuel Francis, like I want to cook with Samuel Francis. He was <laughs> a really great cook. Um, yeah, like he was known for his drink recipes as well. I want to make oyster pie with Samuel Francis. With <laughs> I like it. I saw Mark just gave a big thumbs yeah. up. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. or, or it's terrible. And he made like, good turtle like, soup. Rationale behind that recipe. No, he made good turtle soup. That too, but you know, I, I love a pie. I love yeah. a good pie. <laughs> I'm a vegetarian. None of this sounds good. Anyway. Lessons and historical gossip with Samuel Francis it is what we are leaving. A new program in the works. <laughs> that, when we master time travel, that's the first thing that we will do. Um, all right. So I think that is all for today. Thank you, Mary, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, Lisa and Allie and Amanda for assisting on that. Um, remember, if you are in New York, the museum is open. You can visit our website. You must reserve your tickets first if you want to stop by and visit us and walk on the old floor and see if you hear a ghost walking around somewhere. If you do, let us know. Um, uh, otherwise, Mary, do you have any last things to add? Um, thank you all for listening. This was a big undertaking that I took on last year, so anytime anybody wants to listen to me ramble on, like, these things, I'm all for it. Uh, if you do any, any like further questions that weren't quite answered, if you have any other things that you want to talk about, please email me. You can find my email on the website. I'm always happy to chat about old stuff. It's kind of like my thing. All right. Yeah. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. All of our emails are on the website. Um, thank you to those of you who donated to this evening's event or to the museum more generally. You are helping us keep going uh, in these very unusual times. So thank you all for that. Uh, remember, you can join our mailing list, follow us on social media uh, to keep up with our events. We'll have another lecture coming back in October. We have some great fall programming coming up for you. Um, otherwise, thank you all for spending this hour with us and hopefully we will see you again soon. Good night, everybody. <laughs>